say I am very impressed. The responses were overwhelming. We had over 70 people sign up. And so my initial thought was I'm going to make two 12-man uh, leagues. And we ended up with six fantasy football leagues that I'm in for this season. So let's go over every single team that I drafted in the past week. And uh, yeah, maybe some explanations for how I feel about the draft, why I drafted these guys, and um, the themes of these leagues, because there were so many that I even had the opportunity to mess with, to mess with themes for the leagues. So, um, for those of you who did, did not get a chance to see the Google form, let me just quickly go over that. Uh, it opened up, and the first column was or your email, just so that I could contact you, let you know that you have been added to a league. Yeah, after that, the next couple fields on the Google form was just for me to get an idea of how much fantasy football people have played in their past. So I had a question asking what everyone's favorite platform is, uh, just so that I could figure out which leagues I should be making, you know. Uh, the options were Yahoo Fantasy, ESPN Fantasy, and Sleeper. I personally have only ever played on Yahoo and ESPN. Uh, growing up, I played on Yahoo quite a bit, and then the last couple of years, it's been ESPN. Uh, but I've never gotten the chance to dive into Sleeper, and I know that it is a fan favorite at the time. So I put all these options up. Then in the next question, I asked about how many times, how many years uh, people have been playing fantasy football. And so this was on a 1 to 10 scale. You could put I guess you could put zero for your, no, I, don't, I, I think I took zero out, a oh, one for first year playing fantasy football, and then all the way up to ten, and it was kind of like an unofficial ten plus, so if you've been playing fantasy for ten or more years, then you could choose the slider all the way to the right. Then, after that, um, I believe I had a question about how many, how many championships people had won. Uh, just to get a gauge of what people's experience was like so far. You know, how many really seasoned veteran winning, winning players do we have? How many people have played a while but maybe not won? How many people are very new? Uh, so all of this helped me paint a picture of what everyone's fantasy background was like heading into this. And, uh, yeah, based on all of these parameters, I was able to go in and sort people in, oh, and then draft time. I asked a question about what everyone's preferred draft time was, because obviously that was a big aspect to creating these as well. And then uh, with the 70 or so responses, I was able to break everyone up into six different leagues. And so these were four ESPN leagues and two sleeper leagues. Uh, of these six leagues, originally four of them were themed leagues. So uh, the first one was called Ring Watch. Ring Watch was filled with people who, in the question where I asked if they have ever won a championship before, I had a couple options, and one of them was no, but one day, implying that these are people who are, I think there was also like an option for. Uh, I can feel it. This is my year. So both answers imply that you have never won a championship before. But there's more, more so people who are looking off in the future, not, not like instilling the most confidence in themselves. And then there's those who haven't, but they're eager. They are ready for a victory. And so the first league, I took a bunch of people who had filled out the no but one year option, and I threw them into a league with each other. And so originally I had invited 12 people, and this was called Ring Watch, because other than myself, it is all people who have never won a fantasy football championship before. And so someone will come out of this victorious and uh, be able to claim, yes, I, I finally have won a fantasy football championship. And I think that'll be really cool. I honestly, this might be the one league where I'm not necessarily rooting for a loss, but I'm fully okay with losing, because I think that would be fantastic to uh, have someone go out there and get their first ever fantasy football championship. Um, I'm not going to make it easy on them. I'm definitely going to try with my full effort, but uh, it'll be well, well, well deserved when whoever arises to the top, uh, you know, does so. And so that was the first league on ESPN. 
again because of, you know, scheduling issues and people just not necessarily being able to join or not checking their email. This got trimmed down from a 12-person league to an 8-person league. So this was the first draft that I went through. An 8-man PPR on ESPN. And here is what that looked like. So in this draft, I was picking from the 4 spot, 4th overall. And so in round round 1, we had C.D. Lamb, wide receiver off the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, and I feel like self-explanatory pick. We have the first three people off the board. I believe it was Christian McCaffrey, Bichon. No, it couldn't have been Bichon. Brees Hall, Tyreek Hill. And so fourth was C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb's contract situation has gone. So really, it's just about ball. Just gauging, do you think that C.D. Lamb is worth this first round pick? And I think absolutely. You know, he was the best wide receiver in football last year, fantasy-wise. He still has Dak Prescott throwing him the ball. I don't think that they have done anything on the offense, really, in terms of depth that would take away from his target share. And he just got his huge contract, so now he has to go earn it. I think that the Cowboys, they're still going to be a very pass-heavy team. They were one of the top-scoring offenses last year, and I don't think that they're going to completely fall off a cliff offensively like that. Um, and so, chances are, he does have a very productive season once again. Not too much has changed, and yeah, I like his odds. So, that, that's why I took him as my first pick. Then, in round two, we have Jameer Gibbs uh, running back off the Detroit Lions. In here, I do prefer to kind of alternate between running back and wide receiver. I don't want to go too heavy in any one position, usually. And I like Gibbs because of his dynamic playmaking ability. He is good as a runner, and he's really good as a pass catcher. So especially in PPR, if you can have a running back that can rush the ball and catch the ball, that is usually a big benefit. And Gibbs last year already was quite efficient, you know. He saw limited use in the first half of the season, maybe like the first four or five games, and then he really jumped up in his usage. And with that, he was quite efficient, one of the most efficient running backs in the league. Um, and so I'm expecting a larger workload this year on the Lions offense now that we've fully established him as an entity in this backfield. And yeah, it looks to be like a bright year for him. I think that he'll finish as an RB1 most likely. He already did in his rookie year, and David Montgomery, while he still is going to be a big factor, Jameer Gibbs does handle more of the pass work, and ideally younger, fresher backs do have better fantasy performances. So after that, we move into round three. And this is where I took another wide receiver. Wide receiver off the Arizona Cardinals. This is Marvin Harrison Jr. And I will admit, the third round is not my favorite. I don't really love the guys that are being offered here. Um, I couldn't tell you for sure who was available at this pick because I have my email, my draft email of where it tells me all my picks and it gives me my grade. But typically in round three, you see guys like Drake London and Devontae Adams. Um, usually it's a little bit too late for Michael Pittman, uh, Nico Collins, things like that. And personally, of that bunch, I do veer more towards Marvin Harrison Jr. Just because I feel like when Diaba was on the Cardinals, we saw how Kyler Murray was able to support him first off the bat. Uh, along with that, I think having a high premium when you draft a wide receiver does matter quite a bit. We saw Justin Jefferson his rookie year. We saw Jamar Chase in his rookie year. Usually there's going to be one first round quarterback that does, sorry, one first round wide receiver that pops off like that. And now it's going to be very hard to predict who it is, whether it's Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors. Um, could even go like a Brian Thomas Jr., but of those options, obviously Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors. 
Bears figure to be at the top of their dip charts. I think they are immediately the number one guy in the rooms. And as far as, you know, throwing ability goes, I trust Kyler Murray a lot more than I trust Daniel Jones. And I also trust the O-line of the Cardinals more than I trust the Giants O-line. So with that logic, I think that Marvin Harrison Jr., he is in for a pretty good year. Uh, it, he was, you know, a Heisman finalist in college. He's been one of the most talked about prospects, not even just last year, but for two years now. And I knew that I might be targeting Kyler Murray, and I feel like there was additional motivation to go for that stack. And so, yeah, took MHJ. Then in round four, went with running back off the Buffalo Bills, James Cook. And James Cook, kind of in a similar situation to Jameer Gibbs last year, saw quite a few number of touches and was efficient in that he can run with the ball, he can catch the ball, really does it all, is the workhorse back. Um, things that are notable about his situation this year, there's no more Damian Harris because he retired, there's no more Naeem Hines, so that frees up a lot of touches in that offense. They have Ray Davis and Frank Gore Jr., but those guys, you know, obviously they're rookies, so they, it's going to be harder to fully integrate them immediately. I think there's going to be more trust in James Cook versus these other guys. And then, along with that, you have all the vacated targets with Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis gone, so that means James Cook could see even more targets than he did last year, and he already was seeing quite a few, so all in all, I think that his role expands, he was an efficient guy, uh, really has three down back opportunity, and so he should be finishing pretty well in fantasy, I would say, and I like him at this price, this fourth round price, I do think that he has good value here. Then in round five, Running back of the Seattle Seahawks, Kenneth Walker. Now, I've definitely talked of Kenneth Walker in some of my mock drafts as of late. Um, Walker, everything that they've said about him in camp as of the last couple weeks has been very positive. It seems like they're truly going for a three-down rule for him and getting him more involved in the passing game. And with, you know, the high-flying offense of Washington's college football team now being implemented in Seattle, I think all that extra passing does boost Kenneth Walker quite a bit. He usually does finish in that like RB2, low RB2 category anyways, but if we see an expanded rule and more in the passing game, then he really does have uh, a much higher ceiling. So I, I like the value once again. I think that for where he could finish and where he's going, it was a very nice mix. Round six. We have tight end of the Arizona Cardinals, Trey McBride. Trey McBride broke out last season. Uh, originally, it was playing behind Zach Ertz on the deck chart of the Arizona Cardinals. Once Zach Ertz went down with injury, uh, Trey McBride took over. And then once Colin Murray came back, we saw Trey McBride kind of leading that offensive skill position group uh, in terms of like target share and yeah, mostly targets here, but he looked good, and he was putting up quite a few points, and so now you do have the addition of Morgan Harrison Jr., but with a fully healthy Kyler Murray, Trey McBride has been one of the top tight ends taken off the board consistently. Uh, I've seen it everywhere. Usually it goes like a Travis Kelsey, Sam Laporta, honestly, even Sam Laporta ahead of him usually. So Sam Laporta, Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, and then Trey McBride run around there as well. So, round six, I felt like uh, I'm more used to doing 10 team, 12 team, 14 team, so I'm not seeing Trey McBride all that often, because fourth round is really hard to take a tight end, in my opinion. I usually target round six, but because this was eight man, he was available around six, and I was like, oh yeah, for sure, I'll take him. Then round seven. This is where I took wide receiver of the LA Rams, Cooper Cup. Uh, once again, kind of mind-boggling that he's available in round seven, but obviously much fewer draft picks per round. Uh, and Cooper Cup, you know, if he 
he's healthy, then he's usually pretty good. He hasn't been the most healthy in the last two years. Three years ago, I had the triple crown. Then in the following year, looked every bit as good, but then got hurt. And then last year, he came back. Bukunuku had his breakout. I think Bukunuku does take over. But if you have a healthy Stafford and you have a healthy Cooper Cup, that connection is still very viable. You can get random 30-point games here and there. And I think that with a healthy Cooper Cup, we do see a more consistent floor as well. Uh, because it's not like he doesn't get the targets. He still gets a lot of targets his way. And I don't expect that to change, even if Puka is the breakout star candidate and the wide receiver one on the team. I think Cooper Cup will still see at least like eight targets a game. Then eight in round eight. This is where I took my quarterback, Kyler Murray. Um, you know, Kyler Murray has been a huge discount value quarterback. Uh, in mock drafts the entire offseason just because of his unique ability to run with the ball and throw the ball. Now, obviously, it's not unique to him, but it's unique at his price point. Uh, when you think of him, there are other guys who can do what he does, obviously, like Lamar Jackson does an exceptional job of throwing the ball, running with the ball. Uh, you've got guys like Anthony Richardson, looks to be a similar type, where he can really pick up the ball and run with it. Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts uh, do uh, benefit from their ability to rush with the football as well, mostly taking it in in goal line situations and short distances, but they can definitely scramble. And so, Kyler Murray, you know, he has a good track record. He is a guy that can definitely throw for 3,500 yards and also rush for anything between like 600 to 800 yards. And that is good enough for a top five fantasy finish. So being able to grab him, usually has like eighth quarterback off the board um, significantly behind the likes of Patrick Mahomes Josh Allen Dylan Hurts Lamar Anthony Richardson Jordan Love Joe Burrow Dak uh, you know Kyler was usually not going after but all these people were kind of ranked oh CJ Stroud yeah being able to get Kyler Murray after all of those, uh, it is very nice value, and especially with the stack of Trey McBride, Marvin Harrison Jr., I am leaning very highly into this Arizona Cardinals offense, but this is just one of my drafts, so I'm okay with that. We'll see how it goes out, but I do like all of these players in their prospective season outlook, so I'm fine with it. of the Carolina Panthers, Deontay Johnson. Uh, you know, he can run any route on the route tree. Was a real target hog during his time in Pittsburgh. Definitely commands the ball by creating a lot of separation. And he's being held, brought in to help his struggling Bryce Young. Uh, I kind of view this as like this year's move of DJ Moore to the Bears. Um, Obviously not as hyped, but Deontay Johnson is a very talented wide receiver, and I do think that everything that Dave Canales has talked about him in this offseason, they are making it seem like he's going to be a focal point of the offense. So, do you get a potential, like, definitely wide receiver one on his team, but, like, being able to get them in their ninth round is nice. Then, round 10... running back of the Washington Commanders, Brian Robinson Jr. Brian Robinson Jr., I think in every way he is going to prove to be better than Austin Eckler in that backfield. He's definitely a better rusher already, but last year, Brian Robinson Jr., on his catches, was averaging over 10 yards per catch. That's not really a sustainable number, but definitely shows that he has the ability to get a lot of yardage once the ball is in his hands. And Eckler being brought in for this third down back roll. It's going to lead to Robinson initially losing out on touches, but I think over the course of the season, he will win out that backfield, and Eckler will be more situational, like even more situational rather than timeshare. So maybe not great for instant impact, but I do like the upside of Brian Robinson Jr., as far as the entire season is concerned. Then, round 11, this is where I took running back Raheem Mostert. Mostert just finished as running back two last year in fantasy. Um, very anomaly-like season for him, being 31 years.
years old getting 20 rushing touchdowns on this high high playing fast paced Dolphins offense now obviously all the buzz is around their second year running back Devon Achan and his incredible efficiency and speed but Ray Mostert has not fallen off a cliff or anything like that yet but being able to get him this late it sure feels like a great steal like we're riding him off so quickly when in reality if Mostert still has good football left this could easily be like a Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery type of backfield uh, there's there are situations where you have two fantasy relevant guys in the same backfield uh, Najee Harris, Jalen Warren, things like that and I feel like for where David Montgomery is going and where Ryan Mustard is going this is incredible value so yeah uh, after that round 12 this is where I took wide receiver off the LA Chargers Ladd McConkey Ladd McConkey comes in off of Georgia steps into the slot position where Keenan Allen got a bulk of his targets Keenan Allen is coming off a career year um, maybe not career year but one of the best years of his career and now with Mike Williams gone with him gone Justin Herbert is going to need someone to throw the ball to I don't think that's going to be Quentin Johnston and Josh Palmer as much as it is going to be Ladd McConkey who's going to be playing out of that slot and yeah I figure that he ends up as the wide receiver one on this team then in round 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, we've got quarterback of the Washington Commanders, Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels, very similar situation to a Kyler Murray where you've got a guy who can throw the ball and run with the ball, uh, but instead make it a rookie. So Jaden Daniels has all the tools to be that like special rookie performance you know cam newton his rookie year kyle murray his rookie year a lot of these guys came in the league and with their dynamic playmaking ability they were able to make an instant fantasy impact so with jane daniels you're looking at a guy who potentially has like top five upside and you can get him late like very late compared uh 11th of the quarterbacks off the board so i already have my kyle murray but Round 13, sure, I would absolutely take a shot on him. Then, round 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. This is where I took that end of the Las Vegas Raiders, Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers. He's been lining up all over the field for the Raiders in this uh, preseason, or in the preseason. It looks to be, you know, very crafty playmaker. Nick Saban really talked him up in college. He won the same award back to back. Uh, it's a very tight end, prestigious tight end award. I forget the name. John Lackey, John Mackey. I'm, I'm getting severe deja vu because every time I talk about Rock Bowers, this is exactly the same thing I'd say. But uh, yeah, I already have my stud tight end. May as well take a swing on a rookie, I figured. And then, yeah, in my next two rounds, rounds 15 and 16, I went with Justin Tucker, kicker for the Baltimore Ravens, you know, one of the most accurate kickers of all time. And then, LA Chargers defense, and I went with the Chargers because they have a soft opening schedule. I'm not really someone that likes to keep the same defense for the entire year. I do prefer to plug and play based on the matchup, defensive streaming, as it's called. And so, with the Chargers first week, they're playing against the Las Vegas Raiders, and the Raiders are going with Gardner Minshew as their starting quarterback. Uh, I'm sure that there are going to be a couple of turnovers involved, if, if I had to guess. And then in the next couple of weeks, I think that they're facing off against like the Panthers and either the Steelers or the Broncos. I forget who exactly, but all in all, it's it's a pretty nice opening first couple of weeks and so in a lot of these drafts I did try and go after the Chargers defense with like my very last pick and yeah with that that concludes my ring watch eight person PPR league um that's my entire roster if you want to know the ESPN autograph trader uh, gave me a couple of weaknesses
weaknesses usually gives you your strengths and your weaknesses. In this case, it did not think I had any strengths on my team. It only gave me weaknesses, and that being number one, my defense, which I'll give it LA Chargers defense season long, probably won't be that great, but I don't think they realize I'm not going to keep them the whole season. And then number two, quarterback and you know, if ESPN wants to say that this is a bad quarterback room, I will let it. I guess I did not spend high capital on my quarterbacks, but I personally think with Kyler Murray and Jaden Daniels on the same team, I am in for a solid year. But with all things considered, ESPN's autograph grader gave me a C rating on this draft. Um, if I'm being quite honest, I have never cracked an A on this thing, at least not in this offseason. Every mock draft, every actual draft that I did, the yeah, B was the best grade that I got. So, C, I'm, I'm okay with the C, you know. I like my team. This is honestly one of the few teams that I've drafted where I like every single player on my roster. And that's achievable when it's 8-man, just because, like, you don't have to reach on anyone. You don't really get stuck with people you don't like. So to walk away with a team full of stars that I personally believe in, if it falls on its face, it's completely on me and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with losing on my own accord. I was not backed into any corners. I'm very excited about this team. Then let's move into the second ESPN draft. This is an ESPN 10 man PPR league. Initially, uh, the idea for this league was to have one player from every level of experience. So as I said, on the Google form, you had an ability to mark if it's your first year playing fantasy football, your second year. So I went through, and in this league, I added someone that had one year of experience, two years of experience, all the way up to ten years of experience. And so, this is how that draft went. In this draft, I was selecting from the first round in the third spot. Obviously, I was drafting in the first round uh, from the third spot, from the number three pick. So, in round one, this is where I took running back Brees Hall. Uh, Brees Hall, already a top finisher in fantasy last year, is going to be seeing much more history of 
of scoring touchdowns, and then you take the fact that the Ravens like to feed the running back the ball within the last five yards, he's going to have potentially 15 to 20 touchdowns this year, and I think that will make up for his ability in the passing game. And yeah. Then in round three, he took wide receiver of the Las Vegas Raiders, Devontae Adams. Um, really, I am not a huge fan of Devontae Adams. Um, in fantasy, I think as a player, he is phenomenal. I think that he is absolutely one of the best wide receivers in the league, but his quarterback situation is atrocious with Aiden McConnell and Gardner Minshew. I don't love the passing ability of those guys. Um, I know that Minshew at least was able to sustain Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, as a fantasy relevant wide receiver 2, wide receiver 1 last year, depending on the week. Um, and that is promising, so hopefully as long as there's not too many hospital balls being thrown, then we still see Devontae Adams be relevant in fantasy. But, yeah, he's just in a part of his career where he's facing real shaky quarterback play all those years with Aaron Rodgers, and then the one year with Derek Carr. At least him and Carr had that college connection, and now it's his in the trenches, and so it is what it is. After that, in round with quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles, Jalen Hurts. Now, in my mock drafts, I was not going for these top 10, uh, top, what do you call them, top quarterbacks on the draft board, but I do really like Jalen Hurts' level this year. Jalen Hurts is a guy that two years ago was pretty close to winning the MVP. Like, we saw how he played in that Super Bowl. We saw how he played in the entire season. They were phenomenal. The Eagles looked magnificent. Last year, they, they did fall apart quite a bit, I will admit. But, Jalen Leonard's now. You get Saquon Barkley in the backfield. You get John Dotson as your wide receiver three. And you've got Kellen Moore calling the shots. And when Kellen Moore is running the offense, it's going to be a faster paced. You're going to get a lot more plays in, a lot more passing. And so, I think that Jim Leonard, when you take the fact that he's going to be throwing the ball even more than he was, and you combine that with his rushing ability and the fact that the tush push exists and he's probably going to get at least 10 rushing touchdowns on the year, he has a very strong chance of finishing as the number one overall quarterback on the year. So, while I like Kyler Murray and I like Jaden Daniels for their value on where you can draft them versus like a potential top five finish, I do strongly believe that Jalen Hurts has the best chance of finishing number one overall. So I did take him a couple times and this is one of those times. Then, round one, two, three, four, five. This is where I took wide receiver off the Miami Dolphins, Jalen Waddle. And I will say, this is a pick that I don't know if I love um, Jalen Waddle. He's the clear-cut wide receiver two on his team. I don't think there's any talking yourself out of it. The only time that he would surpass Tyreek Hill is if Tyreek Hill were to go down. And I'm not going to root for his injury or anything like that. So I just have to accept the fact that my wide receiver two in fantasy is actually a wide receiver two on his team as well. And I know that the Dolphins offense is going to be very good and productive, but still I don't I don't love the feeling of in the Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess just Dylan Model last year his season was a little bit disappointing. Two years ago it was pretty good, but at the same time. I know that some teams have done it, but I'm not. I'm, I'm betting on the wrong guy in this offense, it feels like. So, I got him. Yeah. After that, round six. This is where I took George Pickens, wide receiver of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, and Pickens, I think, is the clear got number one guy on his offense. We're gonna have a decent quarterback upgrade. Last year was complaining about the quarterback play in um, Pittsburgh behind Mitch Trubisky and Kenny Pickett. And yeah, it was pretty awful for him. So I don't blame him for being mad at that. Now he gets to catch passes from Russell Wilson, which is quite an upgrade. And so I think that Pickens being the absolute clear-cut wide receiver one on his team. No Brandon 
podcast that he is a Pro Bowl caliber wide receiver. Every year he's been in the league, um, since that year, he has been able to achieve at least like 200 points in fantasy and be at best a wide receiver two, or at worst a wide receiver two. Uh, and then this year there's reports that he's going to be moving back into his slot role where he naturally fits on the field. I thought that was where he had his best year and him returning to playing out of the slot I think should benefit him quite a bit. Yes, Mike Evans is the more talked about wide receiver on this offense, but Chris Godwin should see quite a few targets as well, at least 100 targets, and it's possible that he, with him eating up in the middle of the field, he could get a lot more PPR value, like Mike Evans does get the long, deep passes and the big touchdown scoring plays, which Baker Mayfield showed that he can sustain with Mike Evans having a great year last year, but Chris Godwin... I do think that in round seven you're getting a guy who has finished as a Pro Bowl wide receiver before and he has a good, I'm not going to say he's going to make the Pro Bowl, but I do think that he's going to be better than he was last year. Sorry, that 
I do. 
do have a lot of like timeshare type guys. Uh, Rico Dotto, Chase Brown, Jalen Warren, Blake Corum. These are all guys that like, yeah, barring injury, they might not see that much work. And then guys deeper on the depth chart. I don't know. Uh, I don't hate my bench by any means. I actually dislike my starters more than I dislike my bench. But yeah, uh, for my efforts in this draft, I was able to earn a B. And honestly, it's probably my least favorite team. Just because I don't want the wide receivers. Um, the starting wide receivers, at least Devontae Adams, Jalen Waddle, that is not guys that I usually go for. Those are not guys I was intending to end up with, even with Derrick Henry. I'm okay with it. I, I'm much more okay with Derrick Henry than those other two guys, but this draft was different. It was definitely very different from my ordinary draft. Once I got through round six, you know, Pickens and Godwin, those were guys that I wanted. Warren was a guy that I wanted. Brown, yeah, I've been targeting him here and there. Dowd, old Dobbs, like Gorham, those I was all happy with, but definitely compared to the last draft, not as happy with this one. Uh, I do love Freeze Hall and Jalen Hurts. I do think that those two guys could respectively finish as the best in their individual positions, but the rest of the team, I don't know. So, yeah, let me know what you think about it. And let's, let's do one more before I take a break. Maybe we can speed through this one a little bit faster. Um, very similar idea in this one. There's no team to this, no theme to this league. Uh, it's a 10-man, yeah, 10-man PPR league on ESPN. So in this one, I was drafting from the seventh position. Round one, took Amon Ra St. Brown of the Lions. St. Brown has gotten better every year of his career. He is on this locked and loaded Lions offense. They were able to keep their offensive coordinator. They were able to keep all their key pieces. And now, as they continue to make more playoff pushes, he's a guy that really, like, they design for his skill set and his ability really well. So he, he gets a lot of very specifically designed looks in um, outside of, like, him on his offense. I don't think that's a huge threat in the receiving game for his target share. Uh, you do have Laporta that will be the clear cut number two, but then GMO and like Khalif Raymond, they are not as involved. So it's like, I do think that Amon Ra St. Brown has a lot of value and I was happy to get him in the seventh, seventh pick. Then round two, this one, I went with running back Travis Etienne Jr. of the Jaguars. Etienne Jr. I think last year finished as like the RB3. Uh, sees a lot of volume, decent amount of work in the passing game, and rushing the ball. Tank Bixby wasn't able to cut out of his workload last year. I don't think that anything would change this year. Uh, honestly, probably doesn't finish as high as he did last year because that was a good year for him. But uh, nonetheless, how involved he is in that offense and the fact that they didn't get anyone else to crowd the backfield, I think they're showing trust in him. And so if he's able to stay healthy, he should be able to, with his volume alone, finish in that top 12. Then, after that, went with James Cook again. No need to explain that. Round 4 went with DK Metcalf. Uh, DK Metcalf should also be another benefactor of the new Ryan Grubb offense in Seattle. We've seen what he can do. Freak of nature as an athlete. Uh, has made the Pro Bowl before the last two years. Um, or I guess last year it wasn't as nice for him. But I do think that more passing ability, um, or more passing, in, sorry, more passing in general from the Seattle offense, moving away from the run heavy Pete Carroll mindset will be very nice for DK. And Tyler Lockett getting a year older. DK is like going to I think he's going to have a good year then round 5 took Jalen Hurts again uh, you know he was available in round 5 why am I not going to grab him if I think he's going to finish as number 1 overall round 6 went with a running back of the Minnesota Vikings Aaron Jones uh, Aaron Jones when he's available usually a very efficient back um He's going to be in Minnesota playing with Sam Darnold. I don't think that the Vikings 
are going to have as much success with Sam Darnold as they did with Kirk Cousins. I don't think of Sam Darnold as as good as a quarterback. I don't know if that's a crazy take or not, but yeah, I, I think that the dump off passes should be something that we see a decent amount of, and Aaron Jones will benefit from that. And Jones is quite a bit better than Alexander Madison, and we saw how eagerly they tried to involve Madison early in the year before they realized that he was not good. Uh, so Aaron Jones should be cut out for a decent role as long as he's able to stay healthy. And then round seven, we've got tight end George Kittle off the 49ers. Uh, Kittle is in a little bit of a crowded offense. Plan B and Brandon Ayuk, Christian McCaffrey, and Debo Samuel. But he is like a clear-cut top three, top two tight end in football. Uh, if you are purely going on blocking, he is the best. But as far as fantasy, I think that he's a little too volatile. Some weeks he can give you 30 points, uh, some weeks he can give you 2 points, and that's the game what you're taking with him. Um, but overall, he is a guy that I, I wouldn't mind having on my team because he's playing on a good offense, and usually if you're, you're on a good offense and you're a good player, you'll do well. Um, so I do prefer him over some of the other guys. And yeah, he was available in round 7 to me, I needed a tight end, I figured I'd take him. Round 8, Deontay Johnson. Round 9, Jalen Warren. Round 10, Lad McConkey. Round 11, DeAndre Hopkins. Round 12, Blake Corum. So as you can see, if the guys I like are available, I'm going to take them. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, once again, was just available. I don't like him, but he was there. Then, round 13, went with Hunter Henry, uh, tight end for the Patriots. This was not intentional was going to go after uh, DJ Hawkinson on IR, knowing that I have an IR spot, but that option, he got sniped a couple of picks before me, that I think I was going to go after Zach Ertz, um, because at least as of right now, he's number one on that dip chart for the Commanders, and yeah, he started off the year not too bad, getting double-digit targets from those random quarterbacks that were playing for the Cardinals. I figure he could get a decent amount of volume with new rookie quarterback Jaden Daniels, but he also got sniped, and so I didn't know what to do. I was kind of only looking for a tight end at this point. I just balanced out my roster, and I went with Hunter Henry. I know last year he had two good games to start the year, uh, and that was it, really. Like, whatever. Anyway, after that, round 13, round 14, I mean, this is where I went with Geno Smith, uh, quarterback of the Seahawks. And Geno Smith, I think that he is going under the radar. Once again, we've got a guy that is going to be part of a high-flying new offensive coordinator run system uh, with Ryan Grubb bringing in the Washington air attack to Seattle. So, Geno Smith, two years ago, I believe he made the Pro Bowl, and I, fin I think he finished fifth in fantasy as a quarterback. And so, we're only one year removed from that. Last year, he wasn't as good, but he has that potential to be a fantasy-relevant quarterback. The fact that he's going in, like, these late rounds were almost undrafted, and he has one of the top wide receiver trios out there. Uh, obviously, he might get sacked a lot. Hopefully not, but, uh, yeah, new offensive coordinator, and you have all these weapons at your disposal. I think it'll be a good year for Gino once again, so picked him up in round 14 just because. And then for defense and special team, for defense and kicker, I went with Jets defense because it was available in round 15, and Jets do have the best defense in football. And then Greg Zerline, because he was the best kicker that was there, uh, elevated offense. Greg, Zer Greg Zerline only missed two field goals last year. Pretty reliable reliable guy, can make it from far out, and the Jets offense should be better, so he might get more opportunities this year. And yeah, that was my team, my third draft of this year, my third subscriber league draft, um, and this one is baffling, so the 
this man auto grader. He gives the strengths and weaknesses, right? This one, it only gave me strengths. My strengths were quarterback. It gave me no weaknesses. But despite that, I got a B. <laughs> like, I don't really get it. I don't know what more it wants, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the auto grader grader does auto draft grader does not determine anything so don't be too alarmed by whatever grade you got you can pretty much discard it um whatever it says this is definitely one where i like this game i like this game quite a bit more than the previous one i think i want raw and dk and then travis Etienne and james cook i like those two combos and then jalen hurts that's pretty nice and then with my flex spot, I have, you know, a couple of different options between Aaron Jones, Deontay Jones, and Lamb McConkey. These are guys that I think that could be the, the flex go-to. And yeah, my defense is strong. So got more depth all around. And yeah, with that, I've been recording for an hour now. My voice is going to give out, so let's, let's take a small break here, and I will pick this up. Maybe tomorrow or something like that. So yeah, I'll be back. All right, let's get back into it. So this is the fourth fantasy football draft league that I was a part of, and this was a 10-person league in ESPN Fantasy. So here I was selecting from the seventh once again, and this is how the draft went for me. So in round one, one, I got wide receiver off the Cincinnati Bengals, Jamar Chase. Everyone else that I had listed ahead of him, or I usually prefer to get ahead of him, was taken ahead of him. So, I went with Jamar. I do think that Jamar will have a great year, but the contract situation does scare me. Um, I won't lie. I think that it's a little bit concerning that we're heading into week one, and they have not gotten that worked out, and the holdout was a possibility. Now it is likely that Jamar Chase plays according to his own, you know, words, but ideally they get that finished up by week two, and yeah, it's smooth sailing after that, so I'm hoping for no big hold that. Anyway, after that, in round two, this is where I picked up running back off the Kansas City Chiefs, Isaiah Pacheco. Pacheco is in line for a slightly larger role this year, with Jared McKinnon exiting the picture. Um, yeah, they haven't really done a bunch to fortify this room, this running back room on the Chiefs' offense. I think the Chiefs should be able to move the ball more easily with the additions of Hollywood Brown and Xavier Worthy. So being able to take it down to the, you know, goal line more often, maybe we see more touchdowns from Isaiah Pacheco this year. And then as far as that backfield, you know, competition, Clyde Edwards, a layer I don't think is really involved all that much anymore. And... Uh, they did add some J.P. Ryan, who could take up some of Jarek McKinnon's old role in the passing game, but at least as of yet, uh, it hasn't seemed to have a big impact. I'm making this video after the Thursday night game, where Samaj P. Ryan wasn't all that useful. So, uh, you know, Isaiah Pacheco, for the most part, a three down back, and he's going to get a lot of volume on a good offense, and James Cook. No need to explain that one again. Round four. Uh, inside, inside, this is a little concerning, but round four, I went with Baltimore Ravens tight end Mark Andrews. I hadn't ever owned Mark Andrews before, and I thought, like, you know, may as well go get him in this one. Uh, the idea behind it is the Ravens offense. They never really decorated that well for Lamar. They finally got Derrick Henry, which is nice in the run game, but as fast as as far as passers, you've got Zay Flowers, you've got Mark Andrews, now you've got Isaiah Likely who has emerged, and other than that, it's kind of scraps, you know, Nelson Aguilar, Rashad Bateman, these are guys that don't end up being that productive, and at least last year when Zay Flowers and Mark Andrews were on the field together, Zay Flowers' production did dip, and Mark Andrews was that number one guy. Now, I can't tell if Kansas City just planned for him really well, or if something is going on, but he was a non-factor in that game on Thursday, so I'm hoping that changes, and at least from now, it does 
same like Isaiah likely is a pretty good uh, other tight end on that offense giving them at least one more playmaker so that's nice for the Ravens but for fantasy purposes maybe not the best then in round five jeez I got him in round five interesting okay uh, I went with Chris Godwin here Chris Godwin in round five is a little bit early I will say I guess I didn't like anyone else at this time and probably Amari Cooper was gone I was pretty high on Amari Cooper in my mock drafts and things like that but Godwin is still a player that I like for reasons that I've explained before and yeah he's going to be serving as my wide receiver too on this team it's okay um then round six is where I went with Darren McLaurin of the Washington Commanders I think that Darren McLaurin like stands out from the rest of that wide receiver group quite a bit he's going to be well ahead of Deomi Brown and Luke McCaffrey uh, anyone else who might be involved in that wide receiver room he has put together lots of 1,000 yard seasons and been pretty consistent as a both fantasy wide receiver and just a regular wide receiver and now he's going to get probably the best quarterback play of his career so good time to buy low on him then round seven this is where I picked up Brian Robinson Jr. I feel like I've already explained my thoughts on him round eight is where I picked up Jaden Daniels uh, and he's serving as my actual quarterback in this one no Kyler Murray he is not a backup Jaden Daniels I'm rolling out with him as my my QB1 for this team, so I'm going pretty heavily into the commander's offense, but I do think that stack of Jane Daniels and Terry McLaurin is going to be very nice for me. I probably end up putting McLaurin in my wide receiver spot and moving Chris Godwin down to the flex. Then, in round nine, this is where I took another wide receiver, wide receiver of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Brian Thomas Jr. He uh, he looks to be in a Jacksonville offense that it's not well defined. I can't tell if I talked about him or not. I don't really remember yesterday's video, but he is um, going to be somewhere in that depth chart behind Evan Ingram, most likely. After Evan Ingram, you've got Christian Kirk, you've got Gabe Davis, you've got Brian Thomas Jr., and he was taken in that first round, so we saw him be pretty productive and uh, get a lot of red zone targets when he was on the LSU offense. That could be something that also translates to his NFL game. We don't know where exactly he's going to ban out of that group as of right now. Uh, it seems like most people think it'll be Christian Kirk and then him and then Gabe Davis, and that could be true, but I think that there's potential for Ryan Thomas to jump higher up on that target share list. Uh, inevitably, I think all of those guys will fall behind Evan Ingram when it's all said and done, though. Then, in round 10, I took a running back off the LA Chargers, Gus Edwards. Uh, Gus Edwards, last year, under Greg Roman's, you know, Raven offense, got the most rushes in, most red zone rushes, basically, uh, number of rushes with five or less yards to go until the goal line. That was Gus Edwards' hot spot. He led the league in that area. And with Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh's, you know, running first philosophy, we might just see him get a decent number of touchdowns. And I think he's going to be operating as the 1A running back on this offense. So you're getting a guy who, yeah, he will be splitting touches most likely with J.K. Dobbins, even a bit of Kamani Vidal. But, uh, of that group, I think that he has the most touchdown upside, so there's that. Then, round 11, got Rico Dowdle. Um, once again, I think I have given you my two cents on Rico Dowdle, so let's just move into round 12. And this is where I picked up quarterback Matthew Stafford off the LA Rams. Uh, the reason why I took Matthew Stafford here is just as an insurance for Jaden Daniels. Uh, Daniels is young and a little bit unproven, so if things go south, at least I have another quarterback who is pretty good, uh, and I didn't have to, you know, shell a pretty penny on him. Getting him in the 12th round, I know what I'm getting out of Matthew Stafford. It'll likely be 30 touchdowns, 4,000 yards. Uh, 
no rushing upside whatsoever, but in an offense with Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua, we can expect him to have some weeks where he totally pops off, and I'm okay with that, you know, if it comes down to needing him in the starting lineup. So, yeah. Then, in round 13, this is where I picked up Packers wide receiver Romeo Dobbs once again, and finally, let's move into round 14, and this is where I took tight end off the Washington Commanders, Ben Sino. Uh, ben Sino is the second guy on that depth chart at the moment, sitting behind Zach Ertz. Now, Zach Ertz kind of was in a similar spot last year with the Cardinals. He started the season, went down, and then Trey McBride broke out. Uh, ben Sino in the preseason was looking pretty nice. Uh, he was taken in either second or third round by the Commanders, which is decent capital. And uh, I think he will eventually get into that starting tight end territory. Realistically, did I need to take him? No. Uh, I have Mark Andrews <laughs> and then Sano. I mean, in the moment, I was thinking Mark Andrews is pretty good. Uh, Sano is more of a depth addition that if he starts to do well, if he ends up taking over that starting role and being potentially the guy with the second largest target share, then I could have him and Jaden Daniels, and I have another stack, so just like a deep bench addition. Then rounds 15 and 16, this is where I took my kicker, Cairo, Sandra, Cairo Santos off the Chicago Bears. Uh, he finished number two, or number three overall in kicking points last year. It is kind of hard to guess uh, how kickers will do, but he had a good track record last year. He made most of his kicks. Thought I would take him. And then finally, with my last pick, I took the Chargers defense once again. So, for my efforts in this draft, I got two weaknesses. My first weakness was my defense, which is to be expected. And my second weakness was for my quarterback, uh, Jaden Daniels and Matthew Stafford. So, of those two, I think that my quarterback room is fine. I don't think that it's weakness per se. I think that I will fare well. Um, and overall, I was given a C grade for this draft. Now, I think, I don't think it's that unfair. I think it's here for my efforts. It's fine. I did reach a little on Chris Godwin. I took Mark Andrews at the four. And yeah, maybe I didn't target the best value. I want more value with my quarterback, not with some of my positional players. And when it's, yeah, I'm getting Brian Robinson Jr. in round seven rather than later. It's maybe not the best. I have my clearly established starters, and then I have more of my guys that I'm betting on to win out, but not immediately productive plug-and-play type dudes. So I'm happy with a C, or like, I'm not happy with it, but I understand it, and I accept it. But with that, we are ready to move into... Almost dropped it. Uh, the fifth draft of this fantasy football season. Uh, this is my first one on Sleeper, and I was drafting from the seventh position once again. Uh, these were all completely randomized, so I just happened to land on this number a lot. But, yeah, by this point, I had a decent amount of practice. This Sleeper League also did have a theme originally. It was going to be uh, people who have won fantasy football championships once, exactly once, uh, one of the responses was, I've won exactly one time, and so I took anyone that had responded with that and put them in a league together. So this is all a bunch of people looking for their second fantasy football ring, and that's why I titled this the Double Up League. So this is a 12-person league, PPR on sleeper, meaning that the format of the roster is slightly different. You've got your quarterback, your two wide receivers, your two running backs, but then you have two flex positions as opposed to the one traditionally, and so depth is, it matters slightly more. So in my first round, this is where I took running back Brees Hall, grabbing him at spot seven feels great for me. Um, you know, I'm taking him as early as spot three, so to get him at seven is quite nice. And then, going into round two, this is where I took Marvin Harrison Jr. once again. Um, you know, the 
people that I could have taken other than him at this spot were Derrick Henry, Isaiah Pacheco, Devontae Adams, Drake London, and Travis Kelsey, but this is a 12 team, and I know that I like the running backs in the upcoming rounds probably a little better, so I took a shot on wide receiver instead. Then, round three, I took James Cook. Uh, if James Cook is not good this year, then I am cooked. I have him in so many of my leagues. I really liked him at his price and what he brings to the table. I do kind of need him to do well, considering that I bet out almost every single time across every single draft. So, please, James Cook. <laughs> and then, after that, I went with running back of the New Orleans Saints, Alvin Kamara. Uh, Kamara is a guy who is on the tail end of his career and he's slowed down a bit, not as effective as a rusher anymore, but his passing volume does look to lead the league. When he's healthy, he missed four games last year and he was still tied for third in like targets and catches, um, or I think at least targets. So with a fully healthy season, I do think that he will be leading all running backs in targets and catches out of the backfield. He is still ahead as a depth chart of Kendry Miller. Kendry Miller is hurt. Uh, he's going to spend the first four weeks on the IR, I believe. And so there's not a huge risk of, you know, another guy taking his three-down rule. And so for a guy who is more of a workhorse back, yeah, maybe he's not as efficient anymore. You're still getting great value with Alvin Kamara in, uh, you know, it was going pretty early in ESPN, I think early off in the offseason, his ADP was like in round 5, but in practice he kept getting taken in round 3 or early round 4, so get him right in the middle of round 4 was nice, uh, I'm glad that I was able to leave with him in at least one draft then round 5, I went with my second wide receiver, George Pickens uh, George Pickens once again uh, number 1 receiver out in Pittsburgh yeah so this is an interesting wide receiver room that thus far. <laughs> I've got Marvin Harrison Jr. and George Pickens, but my running backs are very solid with Brees Hall, James Cook, and Alvin Kamara, so I've got my uh, first flex position covered at least. Then at round six, I finally was able to pick this guy up as my tight end. This is tight end Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram is someone I was definitely trying to get in the sixth round if he was ever available, and he just never was. Uh, finally, I got the shot at him. Uh, in this draft, we had Travis Kelsey taken in round two, Sam Laporta taken in round three. Um, looks like right ahead of me, Trey McBride, Mark Andrews, Dalton Kincaid, Kyle Pitts, and George Kittle all in round five, and so it was now or never. Uh, Evan Ingram was available, and I really, he was the last guy of that group that I wanted. Um, well, not the last guy in terms of ranking, but that is the, like, upper echelon of tight ends, in my opinion. And so, being able to get him feels good. I know that he's going to be the leading target guy in that Washington Jacksonville offense. And, uh, two years ago, he finished as a tight end five. Last year, he finished as a tight end two. I see no reason why he can't finish as a top five tight end, and I'm getting him as the eighth tight end off the board. Uh, and so I feel pretty good about my tight end positional advantage with this. Then round seven, once again, Chris Godwin. I also need Godwin to pan out because I'm man oh man to have him in so many of my leagues. So he's going to be filling out my next flex spot. So I've got Marvin Harrison Jr., George Pickens, and then Chris Godwin off the bench. Not the worst for wide receivers. And then in round eight, I went with Lad McConkey. Pretty happy with that one. I like picking up McConkey when I can, outside of Neighbors and uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. I do think that McConkey will have the most worthwhile fantasy season. Like, see if you're worthy got taken ahead of him uh, by a whole round in my draft. And once if you're worthy does have like electric speed, he does figure to be potentially wide receiver three, the fourth option on that Kansas City offense, and that's not really comparable to Lad McConkey, who could be the number one overall option for a Justin Herbert offense. And where they, yeah, he's very fast, but we saw him on very limited touches as well. Target share was only like 10% on Thursday. We haven't even brought in Hollywood Brown. The 
there's a dog barking outside. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, after that, round nine, this is where I went with my quarterback, Jason Daniels, once again. Uh, Kyler Murray was taken a couple rounds ahead, and I'm pretty high on Jason Jan Daniels. I think that he'll do well. So being able to grab him in round nine, I needed to make sure I got him. Uh, don't let him slip to anyone else. But still pretty happy with that. Then round 10, this is where I took Blake Corum. Um, you know, Blake Corum was available. He is going to be behind Kyron Williams, but the way that Sean McVeigh has talked about him, could be involved in the offense uh, more so than we think. And then with Kyron Williams on bond return teams, I think that he's a good stash. He's going to be a very valuable guy to have. Uh, then round 11, this is a blunder by me. Don't know what I was thinking. Honestly, I just was not thinking is the problem. Uh, already had, what, four running backs. I had four running backs. I had five, no, four wide receivers. I had my quarterback. I had my tight end. Could have looked for more depth. Instead, I went with TJ Hawkinson. Uh, not really paying attention to the fact that I already had Evan Ingram. Um, it really made no sense. DJ Hawkinson went out with a does. He is a pretty good tight end, I will say. But Sam Darnold throwing the ball to him. And I already have a, like, very good tight end option. There is no reason for me to make this pick. Um, the guys that I missed out on, it looks like between him and my next selection, I could have gotten Tyler Lockett, Jeb Hubbard, Mike Williams, Adam Thielen, Rico Dowdle, Marshawn Lloyd, uh, Jalen Polk, or Don Davion Wicks. Probably of that group. If I was to go with someone else, might have gone with Marshawn Lloyd. Uh, just knowing that AJ Dillon's on IR the entire year. Uh, and I've already taken Dowdle so many times that it might be nice to just switch it up, get another guy that I have faith in. So yeah, I missed out on Marshawn Lloyd. Instead, I got DJ Hawkinson, who's going to spend six to eight weeks out. So, I don't know. Uh, he'll take up my higher spot. I know someone else needs to. <laughs> then, round 13. This is where I went with Kamani Vidal. Kamani Vidal, I think, is a good late round acquisition, just because those running backs in the Chargers offense, they're kind of worn. You know, Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins. J.K. Dobbins is very injury prone. We have not seen him play a full season in a long time. Um, right now, Gus Edwards is the lead back out there. But Kamani Vidal, uh, based on his college, like yards after contact and um, I guess draft capital. I think it was no, it was taken past round three, not draft capital, but based on his college stats, he's a pretty effective running back runner, and we know that they're going to run the ball a lot out here, so if at any point he is given a shot and he does well compared to those other running backs, I think it'll quickly turn into a committee, and then inevitably someone will go down, and I think that he fills that spot, so for right now, he might be number three on their depth chart, but I think by the end of the year, he'll be closer to like 1B or even 1A, uh, because face it, I don't think that your Gus Edwards, J.K. Dobbins, and Rome is what you want for the future. I think that Kamani Vidal does have much more upside than those guys. It'll just take a while for him to get acclimated. Then round 14, this is where I took my kicker, Greg Sirline, and in round 15, I took Chargers defense. So that rounds out my draft. Uh, and that is that. We move into the sixth and final fantasy football draft of this offseason for me, and this one is by far the craziest. I have never done anything like this. It was a sleeper 14-team league with Superflex. Um, so if you're not familiar, Superflex is when you have a flex spot where you can use a quarterback instead of just your regular wide receiver, running back, tight end options. So this, because it's on sleeper, it has two flex spots, and one of them is a super flex spot. So, uh, yeah, that completely changes the dynamic of the draft, just because you have quarterbacks going off the board immediately. You have teams drafting multiple two to three quarterbacks each uh, to maximize how many points they can get out of that second flex spot. Um, so, it completely changes everything. I will say this is probably the draft and the league that I'm the most excited for, just because it's so different compared to anything that I've done before. I've played a lot of fantasy football, but never super flex, so uh, this is first, and then outside of that, I think this was the most active draft room uh, 
jokes, making comments, um, you know, giving each other props on each other's picks, talking about who is sniping who, and I think it's just a very active group, so it should be a lot of fun. You really test your your depth in a 14-man draft, and especially with something like this where it's super flex, you end up drafting guys that, like, I've never seen come off the board, so uh, yeah, let's get into it. Once again, this is PPR, and this is the first time I've ever drafted from the number one overall spot. Um, and so, drafting from the 1-1 one, one in the super flex, I felt like I had to take the player who I think overall is going to end up with the absolute most points in fantasy, and that was Jalen Hurts. So, in my first round, I have Jalen Hurts as my quarterback. Uh, and yeah, immediately after me, four quarterbacks taken off the board, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Anthony Richardson, and Lamar Jackson, with C.J. Stroud not too far after. Uh, and then there's a big turnaround. It's gonna take a while before my next pick. And then here we also saw Joe Burrow, Jordan Love, Dak Prescott, and Caleb Williams taken off the board. So, very quarterback heavy. Heading into round two and three, I was able to draft my running backs. First up, I had Travis Etienne, who I've explained uh, should be in for a workhorse role, uh, involved in the passing game, involved in the running game on that Jaguars offense. We saw him have a good year last year, but in round three, I was finally able to get Devon Etienne, who uh, has been talked up so much since last year. Led the league in 40 yard plus runs, has immense breakaway speed. As long as he's healthy, he should be in for a fantastic season, and I've been wanting to get him in any of these drafts, and finally I was able to get him here, so very happy with that. Let's move on into rounds four and five. Uh, round four and five, I needed wide receivers. So here is where I took Debo Samuel, wide receiver off the San Francisco 49ers. Debo, I think that his value isn't as good as it used to be, because back when they didn't have Brandon Ayuk broken out, when they didn't have Christian McCaffrey, we were seeing him lining up all over the place and bringing value in all these other ways. Now Debo is, like he'll still do some stuff out of the backfield, but it's not as often because you've got the best running back in the game with Christian McCaffrey, and then I do think that he is dropped down to the second best wide receiver on his team with Brandon Ayuk there and not being traded. So, not as much upside, but his yards after the catch ability is still phenomenal and he does do more than Ayuk. Like, he brings more to the table than Ayuk. Um, and, yeah, compared to the other guys available, I did like him. By the way, in round five, I had back-to-back -back picks, so I took Debo, and then I took DK Metcalf. I'm happy with the DK Metcalf pick. The other guys that I could have potentially gone with were DJ Moore, Devontae Smith, Malik Neighbors, and Rishi Rice. Now, the problem with those guys is I think DK Metcalf is at the top of his trio, and I think that DJ Moore is as well, but I, at least for right now, trust Geno Smith to DK Metcalf more than I do Caleb Williams to DJ Moore, uh, just because we don't know what that connection is like. What if he ends up preferring Keenan Allen? What if he ends up preferring, uh, it's unlikely, Roma Dunn's because he's taking a backseat in that depth chart, but yeah, Keenan Allen being on that offense, it's not as clear-cut who is the wide receiver one. Like, those are both, Keenan Allen is better than DJ Moore, but he's older, so who knows how it works out. DK Metcalf is the best wide receiver in Seattle, so that's why I prefer him there. Um, and Debo, I think, is just more talented guy. Devontae Smith is clear-cut second guy on his offense. I don't want him. And then Malik Neighbors is definitely the number one guy, and I could have taken him, but it's quite a bit of risk just because it's Daniel Jones. Uh, we're going to have to see how that works out. Under the Daniel Jones era, we have not seen very good wide receivers. And while I do think that Malik Neighbors has a lot of hype, they even unretired a jersey number for him, which I think is frankly kind of ridiculous. I, I don't think you do that. But, yeah, uh, I'm okay with watching from the sidelines for Malik Neighbors. And if he pops off, I'll be very happy for him. But uh, it it is a lot to risk. <laughs> Anywho, after that, heading into round six, this is where I took Geno Smith because I figured I have DK. I need a second quarterback because so many were. 
taken at this point. Uh, I mentioned everyone until round two. Round three, we saw Brock Purdy, Tua, Jaden Daniels, Justin Herbert go off the board. Round four, Jared Goff, Matthew Stafford, Trevor Lawrence. Uh, and then round five, Kirk Cousins. And then round six, Deshaun Watson, Aaron Rodgers, Baker Mayfield. And at this point, like, I know that Gino is one of those, like, guys that people have not been paying as much attention to. But if I don't get him here, I don't think that he'll be available on my next turn. And I do want the stack, so I got Gino. Uh, we, I have two quarterbacks at this point, and most teams already have their second. One team already had three. Very weird. Very, very surreal drafting in a super flex draft. Uh, nothing like anything I've ever experienced before. And then in round seven, this is where I took tight end Jake Ferguson. Jake Ferguson is probably the number two option on that Cowboys offense. I needed a tight end, and I think that Jake Ferguson fits nicely into the second tier of tight ends. Uh, first tier being like the first eight guys off the board, and then tier two being David Njoku, Brock Bowers, Jake Ferguson. These guys are all kind of in a similar mix for me. And I did take Ferguson ahead of those other two options. Uh, just because he is like Dak's red zone threat, I think that Dak likes targeting him in the red zone quite a bit. And outside of C.D. Lamb, Jake Ferguson will see the most targets, I believe. And so, don't mind him here. Not my preferred tight end tier to be in, but at the same time, uh, it's super flex. Like it's a, it's a deep, deep league, and I, if I wanted anyone else, I would have had to do it before round six, and that's a little too crazy in my opinion. So I'm happy with the way things panned out. Then after that, I had a long wait until round eight, and in round eight, I was able to grab Deontay Johnson. Happy with that pick, you know, beef up my wide receiver room, gonna have him play in that next flex spot, so, yeah, uh, I like that. Then round nine, went with Brian Robinson Jr., as I've been doing in a lot of these drafts, I think that he is splitting touches, but eventually he'll win out, and that'll be nice for me. Round ten, went with the guy that I know, Rico Dowdle. Once again, splitting touches, but looks to be ahead in that pack. Round 11 is when I finally changed things up, and I took wide receiver off the LA Chargers, Josh Palmer, uh, Joshua Palmer. He is the only guy on that offense that has an established connection with Justin Herbert. Uh, you know, we have new guys like Glad McConkey, uh, DJ Chark, uh, and then Quentin Johnston exists, but... So far, that connection has not been good. There's no chemistry. They don't really seem to be on the same page. Whereas Josh Palmer has been somewhat reliable in the last couple of years. Um, and I think that he, when it is all settled, will be the wide receiver two on that offense. And so uh, that's not a bad place to be. You're getting wide receiver two on a Justin Herbert passing offense. He could have some value. Um, And then, after that, we go into round 12, and this is where I took a guy that I have not taken any of my other drafts, but I uh, could pan out very nicely. This is Malachi Corley of the New York Jets. Uh, he was drafted by them, and I think the third round, and so far, the way that they've talked about him has been promising. They've said that he will be filling in like a Debo Samuel type role on that Jets offense. Now that depth chart after Garrett Wilson is a big, you know, head scratcher. You've got Mike Williams, you've got uh, Corley, and then Lazard. I forget who else really, but Corley could very easily end up being the number two guy on that offense. And so grabbing him here, if he is going to be in the backfield as well, um, sounds like they, they like him. You, you don't just do that with anyone. He must be dynamic in that way. And so, uh, yeah, I'm kind of excited to see how his season goes. I don't know if I'll end up getting the chance to play him, if he'll really break out like that, but, uh, we'll see. <laughs> and Drake 
does not seem like anyone is excited about Derek Carr on that offense. Chris Olaf, <laughs> he was asked recently in an interview, like, is there anything that you've seen so far in practice that year, this year, that has made you think, like, wow, we're gonna be good, and Chris Olaf laughs at it for, like, five seconds, and then he's like, no, not really. So, it seems like they're coping. Maybe if the season goes badly enough, Derek Carr is you know, benched to see what they've got on Spencer Rattler. I'm not going to say that that's going to happen, um, but in case it does happen, I'm prepared. Uh, or if the car just goes down with an injury, and then, yeah, I mean, it was really between him or Michael Penix Jr. Um, I don't know, maybe Penix was a better move here, but really, I, I was so lost because all of the starting quarterbacks were gone. I, I couldn't think about it logically. Anyhow, after that, round 14, this is where I took Kamani Vidal once again, just filling out that last bench spot with depth. Um, and then rounds 15 and 16, this is where I took kicker for the Eagles, Jake Elliott, and Chicago Bears defense. Uh, the Bears play the Titans in week one. I feel like Will Levis, Lewis Kane, and Evan Orr might throw one to two picks. Could benefit off of that. Uh, and then Jake Elliott. This is not a real strategy, but this is something that I thought of recently. Um, when drafting a kicker, it might be beneficial if your quarterback and your kicker are on the same team. Uh, just because when your offense is out there and you charge the ball down the field and you're not able to get it done, instead of walking away with no points whatsoever, if the kicker goes out there and kicks the field goal, then that offensive drive is still a success. So if you're getting a quarterback on a team whose offense that you trust, having a stack of the kicker and the quarterback could be nice just because like any successful offensive drive, you're guaranteed to walk away with points. Uh, now you can, you can call that smart, you can call that absolutely stupid, and I would agree with you either way. I don't know if there's any actual benefit to doing that, but it was something I thought I thought I would share it. Uh, but yeah, that concludes my final, sixth and final subscriber league draft of this offseason. And, um, yeah, I'm excited. First and foremost, I'm very excited to see how it goes across all these. These are leagues of four different sizes, 8-man, 10-man, 12-man, 14-man, two different platforms, two different styles of roster, three different really if you're considering super flex. It's a lot to juggle. Honestly, don't even know how to feel about it because like once you're in more than two leagues, you own so much of the league that like I can't really root for anyone in particular. I kind of would just see how everything plays out and be like, okay, and then I'll try and adjust um, as it stands. I don't know which team I like the most it might honestly be this 14 DM one because I feel like uh, a lot of people in this draft were talking about how they hated their team or something went wrong. I'm I'm not too upset with it. I feel like for a 14 man draft, this could have gone a lot worse for me. Um, getting Hertz, Etienne, HN, Samuel, Metcalf, Geno Smith, Ferguson, Deontay Johnson as my starting unit. I'm pretty okay with it. I think that the bench, if I ever do have to tap into that bench, Brian Robinson Jr. would be productive. Outside of that, Rico Dowd, or Josh Palmer, Malachi Corley, uh, Malachi Corley, and Kamani Vidal. Really speaking, only Dowd could provide instant impact. Maybe Palmer on a good week. I don't know about those other guys. Uh, Spencer Rattler. So, bench is a little thin, but my starters, I'm happy with it. And... Yeah, uh, out of all of these drafts, I think initially I was expected to lose five of my six week one matchups. I didn't like the way I was drafting. Um, and then I think that slowly got adjusted to me only losing four of them. As of right now, Hertz has played for me, Pacheco has played for me, Derek Henry has played for me. Uh, Pacheco did fine. I think that. Elliot, he did pretty well. Uh, Hurts, too many turnovers. Uh, overall, he had a solid game, but slightly under his projection because he threw two picks and he had a fumble lost. So, that ball 
security stuff I think he'll fix so happy to have him uh, and then Derek Henry probably was my worst thus far um, just because he didn't get a ton of touches they were down for a lot of the game and uh, yes at least able to salvage that touchdown so not a horrible day from him and oh Mark Andrews he is my worst so far and that one league right on Mark Andrews I'm not not doing too hot there uh, and I think in two of my leagues I've played Saquon Barkley so um, might be I mean it's never too late I could easily still win those ones but yeah to have that running back outscore my quarterback in those leagues yeesh anyway that is all six of my fantasy football drafts uh, from this league from, from this year uh, let me know what you think let me post all of my rosters right here real quick just so that you can get a final look at it see what my starting rosters look like uh, judge critique make fun of praise I don't know I don't know how you feel about any of them uh, six is a lot I don't really, I really have never played with I think three is the most and that was early on when I was still on Yahoo and then I cut it down to two six might be a lot for me to handle just with all the waiver wires and things like that definitely as far as fantasy football content going into this year I'm not going to be able to talk about any of these leagues they're just too much going on and there's too many leagues uh, instead someone had a suggestion where every week after the week's worth of action has passed I talk about the best fantasy performers on that week and I actually really like that idea so I might talk about the top five quarterback finishes wide receiver running back tight ends uh, to start off the video or who popped off and then I can mention maybe who I had in if that helped me win and like briefly tell you across the six leagues if I won or lost but then I'm not really gonna get into the specifics of matchups and things like that uh, in the second half of the video I'll get into my waiver wire additions and advice where I'll try and suggest the top additions at each position uh, and make sure to throw some people who are usually for the waiver wire I only suggest people who are owned in 50% of leagues or below I will probably have a section for like at least 20 and below because 14 team is deep and I know that some of you are in leagues as big as like 16 people which is insane so I'm gonna go for like the extreme sleeper of the week it'll probably be a category and yeah so thank you for watching as always if you like content like this feel free to like comment or subscribe I'll be making more videos as the weeks pass and yeah thanks for watching and I will see you